United States and I am in Maryland, which is where my home is. And as you noticed, I work at George Mason University, which is in Fairfax, Virginia. And so I live and work in the Washington DC area. So that's where I am and it's 5 p.m. Now I know many of you are from places where you're up pretty late as I could see in the chat box. And so I'll try to do my best to keep you awake. And I thank you all from wherever you are coming to us from the world for joining us to talk about a very exciting topic which is about grammar, but it's exciting because we're talking about teaching grammar to young learners, which is, of course, my favorite topic. And I would like to get started right here. And I'm sure since you are all teachers, you are all very aware that grammatical structures are the building blocks of language. It is very important. To use a language means knowing how to use many aspects of grammar, right? Knowing word order, subject, verb, object in English, knowing how to add the S to third person singular, knowing what an auxiliary verb is, knowing what irregular past tense verbs are, right? All very important things. But of course, these are important to know and use correctly when you're learning a foreign language like English, but when we're talking about young learners, we always have to remember that the approach to teaching grammar should match the way students learn. So when we're talking about young learners, and specifically, what do I mean when I say young learners? Young learners are usually, we think, children who are at the primary school age level. And very young learners are, of course, um, in the pre-K, kindergarten, early childhood ages. And so these are the types of learners that I'm talking about. And so if we need to make sure the way we teach grammar matches the way our children learn, we need to think about how they learn. So how do children learn? Of course, as you probably know, children are active learners and thinkers. They learn by doing. And they're also social learners. They learn through interaction with their peers as well as their teacher. And so take a look at these second grade students who happen to be in Mexico. They're working together on a project and once they are finished, they will present the family on their poster together. And I know that this doesn't necessarily look like a grammar lesson, but by the end of this webinar, you will see that this type of activity is great for teaching children grammar. And so, Let's think about the right approach for teaching grammar, given what we just talked about, about how children learn. According to Lynn Cameron, the approach to teaching grammar should be learning-centered. So like we said uh, just before, it has to match the way children learn. It has to be meaningful and interesting. If kids aren't interested in your lesson, they won't retain very much once your class is over. And that's not what we want. With language, that means that the learners need to experience the language through lots of meaningful exposure and input, right? So lots and lots of meaningful input. So uh, children are also social learners as we said, and language is all about communication. So your approach also needs to encourage interaction. And as we said, children learn by doing, so they need to use grammar and to be active participants in the lesson. All right, so that's the approach we should probably take when teaching grammar. So I have a little puzzle for you. 
It's actually an equation. Young learners plus grammatical explanations equals question mark. How would you finish this equation or how would you finish this sentence? Please type your ideas in the chat box. Oh, boring. Meaningful trouble, chaos, <laughs> boredom, disaster, confusion, boring, confusion, boring. Yes, okay. So, since we just talked about how children learn, we have to consider the fact that children don't learn through grammatical explanations. Rather, they gain an understanding of the grammar implicitly through repetition and recycling of the language in different contexts and in meaningful contexts. So young learners plus grammatical explanations equals, hmm, maybe bored learners. Students may not understand these abstract explanations of grammar, so they might be sitting there bored, or maybe tired learners, because if you do not engage learners actively, then they might start to get very sleepy. And they also might become somewhat worried or stressed because your class becomes only about form and accuracy. Okay, instead of a classroom that is active and interactive where students can communicate ideas or play games through English. So it might become then just a subject and all about the grades if you're only focused on grammar, form, and structure. So maybe some of your students might be just a little bit angry or misbehave because they don't want to just sit around and listen to your grammatical explanations and just sit there doing exercises, right? Okay, and I like what I see Aurora just said. The most important thing is just lack of understanding, right? So they're not necessarily going to even follow what you're talking about. When they're young, they don't necessarily understand abstract concepts such as grammatical explanations. And so, uh, Lynn Cameron said it best when she wrote, children see the foreign language from the inside and try to find meaning in how the language is used in action, in interaction, and with intention rather than from the outside as a system and form. So that system and form is what we, we're talking about when we talk about grammatical explanations, right? They're learning it from the, from the inside right so in action of course means learning by doing in interaction means through social activities and with intention means the activities have a real purpose to use language okay i think we can all agree on that but of course that doesn't mean that teaching grammar is easier to kids as Pinter points out, for children, learning grammar is a messy process requiring the teacher to provide lots of meaningful practice, recycling, and guidance in attending to language form. Okay, it's like this child here with all these bubbles around, right? It's not systematic, right? It's not like you learn it one by one. So you're not going to explain the grammar, right? For third person singular, add an S to the end of the verb. And then do the grammatical exercise. I sing, you sing, he sings, she sings, I talk, you talk, she talks. And then now all of a sudden you've learned the grammatical rule and you can use it accurately when speaking, right? That's not how language works. So. The teacher should expose children to language in authentic and meaningful context and use repetition and recycling in order to improve young learners' ability to understand the new language structures and use them correctly. So to sum up where we are now, the approach to teaching grammar, right? We wanna make sure it's learning-centered meaning it matches the way students learn, right? Active, interactive, and meaningful. As Pinter explains, the teachers should give plenty of meaning-focused input. This means lots of exposure to listening to language and context and reading language and context. 
And Pinter and Cameron both emphasize that this approach to teaching young learners encourages them to notice the grammar rather than being taught the structures explicitly. So this is a part of being an active learner and thinker, right? See the girl in the picture? Do you see what the girl is looking at? What is a girl looking at? Okay, so the girl, that's right, Sharon, the girl is examining a fossil by herself. So I'm sure she is noticing many things about this fossil and gaining her own understanding of it, right? Maybe it's a part of class, but this is where she's interacting with it by herself. And so we want to provide our young learners with language used in real world contexts. And then children start to make their own connections and they'll start to notice the word order or notice that the S is added to the verb with he or she. And they're learning language, therefore, from the inside, as we stated before. So here are some tips for teaching grammar to young learners, and we've talked about it all. First, very important then to contextualize the grammar. Okay, contextualize it. We're not teaching it explicitly, we're teaching it within a context. And hopefully you're able to use natural, real world contexts to try to make the language authentic. In addition, we need to use a variety of tasks, right? If you teach young learners, you know, they can get bored pretty easily. So we need to have a variety of tasks that they're interested in. Also, we want to make sure we're practicing the grammar using all four skills. And finally, because they're kids and we want to keep them interested, sometimes it's good to use games to reinforce the target structures. And so I'll be giving you some examples of that. All right. So um, real world context, we said. Now, these are examples of authentic oral text types, and these are ones that kids, um, you know, whether they are actually learning their native language or a second or foreign language or an additional language, right, we use these types of text, songs, chants, storytelling, plays, TV shows, etc. These are all examples of authentic oral text types for kids. And do you use some of these? I'm sure you use many of them, maybe even all of them in your classroom. Okay, so we want to try to connect them to the real world using these. And then, of course, here are some examples of authentic written text types. Okay, just some of the things that you probably use, stories, poems, if they're older, young learners, emails and text messages menus, flyers, etc. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but important to kind of think about the fact that these are um, text types that you might want to use in your classroom in order to introduce the grammar. Okay, so now what I want to do is to start talking about how to set up your lesson or create a lesson plan that helps to teach grammar effectively using these tips that I've mentioned. Okay, so what we want to do first is to create and, and present a real world context. In this case, I'm going to give you examples from a unit about animals, about animal habitats, and I hope that you enjoy it. Okay, and before we do, okay, let's just think about how we set up a lesson to teach grammar. So maybe if you just have a grammar-based lesson, okay, and maybe this is the old way of doing things, your lesson objective was focused on learning a grammar point. And then the teacher um, maybe presented the grammar point, possibly in the L1, the native language, not even in the target language English. And then the students do grammatical exercises and then practice the grammar in some kind of a context, but oftentimes it was like a sentence level context, not an authentic context. How many of you learned English or learned grammar in this way? 
Ah, Anna says, yes, that was primary school, I remember. I was taught like that. Me, 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 me. Yes, everyone, right? Me too. Me too. When I was learning foreign languages, uh, that's exactly how I learned it, right? I learned how to conjugate the verb to be, you know? And then what? Can you use it in a sentence or could I use it if I was talking to somebody else? No. So, it's very important that when you use real world context or bring in a context like a story or a song, you have to set up your lesson differently. And so many people use this way to create a contextualized language lesson. So first of all, the lesson objective is always the focus is instead of the grammar point is about using language communicatively. Okay, sometimes there's a task and then Many people like this PPP approach, right? There's a presentation of language and then students practice and then they uh, produce or the production stage. How many of you use a PPP in your lessons? Okay, so that is very popular and I'm going to present to you what I think are effective uh, steps of a lesson that aren't so different from present, write language in context, practice language in context, and produce language in context. Um, but I have some additional steps, and the reason why I'm giving them to you is to show how you can kind of step by step help students to use grammar um, communicatively. And so, but you'll notice that in the present language context, that's the part about like giving meaningful input, right, through listening or through reading. And then the practice language and context. So during presentation, students might be comprehending. And then as they're practicing, then this is when they start to really notice the grammar. Okay. And then in the production part, uh, hopefully this is where you're matching their learning styles and making it learner centered. Okay, so let me start by presenting another way to look at a lesson plan that is for contextualized language learning. Okay, and what do you see here? This is like um, a map that I have. So let's say a lesson plan is like a road map and it's for a trip that you are taking your students on. And the final goal or destination, of course, it can't be reached without careful planning each stop along the way. And you have to make sure you have all you need to get to that final step where the X is. And what does the X represent in your lesson plan? A map for treasure. Yes, the treasure is you're fluent in English. <laughs> yes, it's the end goal, the treasure, the objective. Okay, Luis, thank you. Luis said what I was getting at. That is, those are the lesson objectives. That's where you want to end up by the end of the lesson. Okay, so the final destination, those are your lesson objectives. And of course, a good lesson plan specifies those objectives or the goals for a class period. Now notice, your lesson objectives are not going to be grammar based, right? So instead, okay, you might have objectives like this. By the end of the lesson, students will be able to, and this is for a unit on animal habitats. So in this lesson, they're going to be able to say what animals look like and then use why and because to talk or sing about cause and effect. Okay, and so this is what we're going to do in this lesson today. And so I'm going to take you through these steps, warm up, present, practice, apply, extend, and then wrap up. Okay, are you ready? Okay, so first, of course, we have the warm up. Now, I know a lot of teachers do a warm up, right, to get students ready for the lesson. But what I want to say is the warm up is such an important step in a contextualized language lesson because you, I'm asking you to present a real world context or an authentic context, or you're going to present a context within which language is going to be learned, which means that the warm up step to prepare students for that context is so important or students won't understand anything, right? So you might, of course, be creating interest and excitement about the topic, 
but most importantly, you're preparing students for the new language input. And that means activating their prior knowledge and even reviewing known language. You might even teach them some new vocabulary, but why? So that when you present the context, they will be able to gain as much comprehension as possible, and therefore, they will be ready to start to notice the grammar. Okay, if they don't understand anything in the context, then it's going to be hard for them to notice the grammar, right? You need to have comprehension to notice the grammar. All right, so we have an animal habitat. This is actually an example from our world um, in level three. Okay, so students might be seven, eight years old, something like that. And isn't this an amazing photo, by the way? Some people think it's photoshopped, but it's not. It really happened that all of these lions were just hanging out in a row for the photographer. Amazing. Okay, so what we see here are some lions, and before we get into the lesson, I want to be able to describe some of these animals. Okay, so let's review, students, some of the animals we learned last time. Okay, so what is this green animal? You're all my students now. You can type your answers, even though I'd ask you to call out. Yes, it's a frog. And the frog has long, what? The frog has long legs, very good. And what is the white animal? Yes, it's a polar bear. And what about the polar bear? It has thick, white, very thick fur, very good. All right, and what is the last animal, the animal on this side? Yes, it's a giraffe, and the giraffe has a very long neck. Excellent. Okay, so we can also play charades to warm up because you know these animals. Okay, so who am I? Who am I? Yes, I'm a giraffe, and I'm eating the leaves at the top of the trees. Okay, good. So that's how we might warm up to review the animals. Okay, and then I'm going to present a context after that. Okay, we might take more time to play the game. We don't have time now. So now is where I'm going to introduce the new language structures, but within a context. In this case, it's going to be a song. And... The idea is that we're going to provide lots of meaningful listening and reading input, and the goal is to help students gain comprehension of new language. So here is the song that we're going to learn. Okay, and you can start to sing along if you want. Okay, it's a very uh, fun song. Okay, here we go. Okay, it stopped, yes. Okay, let me try again. Okay, so it's not working, and that's okay. Why does a giraffe for you. have Are you a ready? long, long neck? Why? Oh, it's okay now. You can hear it. Why? Because it eats leaves at the tops of the trees. Because I want to know why. Why does a frog have strong legs? Why? Why? Because it hops, swims, and jumps. So many things, and I have. 
have just one thing to say. Why? Why does a polar bear have white fur? Why? Why? Because it lives in ice and snow. Okay, so it's done. Actually, I didn't even hear the song because for some reason it's not working here, but I'm glad that all of you did. And it is very catchy. And we're going to sing it a little more, okay? So, in this song, of course, we are practicing certain grammatical structures, right? And what are they? Okay, so you might give them some examples. But you're not necessarily going to actually explain the grammar. For example, you're not going to necessarily explain uh, the word order for forming a question. You're just going to use the repetition and recycling to be able to help learners notice how to form the questions and the answers and to use why and because. And because of this context, students and young learners, they're going to be able to understand how to use that grammar. Okay, so uh, the next part, right, after you sing the song, is you might give students some more practice, okay? So this will help students internalize what they're learning and develop proficiency. So we might guide practice with structures and support to help produce target language. Uh, the goal is to provide many opportunities to try out new language, and we're preparing them for real communication, okay? All right, so let's say you do a grammar activity such as this, okay? So maybe you'll ask students, why do leopards have spots? Why? Okay, I see B, because they need to hide in the trees. Now, you can put this to the tune of the song, right? Why do leopards have brown spots? Why? Why? Because they need to hide in the trees. Okay. Thank you for the singing. I didn't even hear the song, but I know the song because it's a part of the Our World series. Okay, so now I'm going to sing you the next question. Why does a polar bear cover its black nose? Why? Why? D, okay, why don't you sing it out loud or sing it with me? Because it wants to hide in the snow. <laughs> I want to know why. I want to know why. Why? Because I want to know why. Okay, so you can add uh, practice to the song. So you can do the exercise, but it's still good to put it in the context of the song to help build the comprehension and make the class more meaningful and interesting. All righty. Now, the next step is to apply. So now that we've practiced, now we want to use language in a personalized way. Now we made the practice fun, even though it could look like a typical activity matching, okay, but it was meaningful and you can sing it. So now maybe we're going to use the language more communicatively in a realistic context and we want to personalize it, meaning connect it to students' lives and encourage 
students to communicate with each other. So here we go. Now we want to work with a partner, okay, and talk about these different animals. So the example is, I don't like spiders. Why don't you like spiders? Because they are ugly and scary. Okay, now maybe your students need some scaffolding. Okay, so take a look. Ah! <laughs> Do you like spiders? No, why don't you like spiders? Because they're <gasps> scary. What else? How would you describe them? Scary, ugly. Mm, ugly, scary. Oh, Anna thinks they're cute. Hairy, nasty, frightening, creepy, dangerous, poisonous. Okay, so when you prepare your students, you can help them by brainstorming some of these adjectives. So then when we practice, we can say, oh, I don't like spiders. Why don't you like spiders? Because they are hairy and creepy. Okay, so you can practice with a partner and then remember social learning. Then in a group of three, you can tell each other how your partner felt. Okay, so in this case, she doesn't like spiders because she thinks they are hairy and creepy. Okay, so next, why don't we practice again? Do you like baby elephants? Hmm, aw, I like baby elephants. Why do you like baby elephants? Because they are sweet, cute, adorable, beautiful. Yes, they're beautiful and lovely, funny. All right. So that's the idea. So you can do an activity that might seem typical, but try to make it more interesting and help your students to be able to practice the grammar. If that means building a few more vocabulary words so that they feel comfortable communicating using the language, then that's what you should do. Okay, five, the fifth step is to extend. So these are additional communicative activities for practice, application, enrichment, and it stretches students' abilities to communicate in real world situations. Now, maybe you want to do like a project, like making this mobile, and you have the animals and their habitats, and you can describe them. Okay, yes, Omar says reinforcement. Absolutely. You want to give them a chance to communicate more. So maybe students um, create this, or maybe you don't have enough time in class. So you want to finish up the class by asking students what their favorite animal is. So let's say they said, oh, my favorite animal is a polar bear. Right, and the polar bear, as we said, has white fur. But why? Why? Why does a polar bear have white fur? Why? 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 To hide in the snow. Thank you, Jasmine. Because it lives in the snow. Because it lives in the ice and snow. Very good. Okay, so if every student has their favorite animal, then you can learn more words, sing the song again, and actually sing it together. And so that would be how you wrap it up. You conclude the lesson with a final activity. So it could be a game, uh, it could be uh, presenting, this, they could present their mobile that they made, okay? But the idea is that all your students should leave the class knowing that they've learned something and show that they're able to use the grammar correctly. 
All righty. So, now I mentioned that grammar games are great for practice. So any way you can make the practice more fun is great for young learners. And so here are some games that I'm going to present to you. I think we'll have time for all of them. So the first one uh, is a word card sort. Okay, and uh, you can use a song that has Q&A. And also we're going to personalize it. Okay, so we're also going to do an activity called Fix It with a story and then look at two games, Grammar Dice and Grammar Spinners. All right, so first let's try to play this next song and I'm only going to play the first verse. So Emily, if you can help me out with the song. Okay, and... Hi everyone, this is Emily. Um, it looks like we just lost Joan for a second. Hopefully she's able to just join back in one second. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and just play this song so we don't lose it at all. Um, but Joan, actually Joan just logged back in so she'll be on in one second. I, Ryan, I don't have my video on so don't worry about me. Um, Joan's just getting back in and set up. She should be back on any second. Here she is. Hi, everyone again. I got logged out. I'm so sorry. Did you hear the song <laughs> while I was gone? <laughs> oh, not yet. Okay, I don't know what happened. Okay, here, let me try again. What are you wearing? What are you wearing? Did you like the song? I'm only going to play part of it. Okay, some people are wearing their pajamas. <laughs> I'm wearing my polka dot pajamas. Okay, so after you listen to the song, which is a Q&A, what are you wearing? I'm wearing my black bl blouse. You can have students do a little word card sorts. Okay, these are word cards, and so... Um, you can, if you have a game, you can click and drag, or you can just create word cards like this, right? So what I would do is I would give one student this card, and then give another student this card, then give another student this one, and give another student this one. And then all four students have to stand in a row, stand in a line, and make a sentence in the right order. So they would have to stand in the order of what are you wearing? And then hold up, hold up their cards. So together, your young learners will make a sentence. Now, what's missing from this sentence? What are you wearing? Huh. Yes, Joyce, the question mark, okay? So you can have another student get up there and be the question mark, okay? So this 
it's a fun game, but it also helps students recognize that this is how you form a question in English with words in this order. Okay, and then you can give uh, students the other word cards, maybe another group, so that they can make the sentence, I'm wearing my purple pants and I really like them. Okay, so the word cards have and I really like them. Why? Because it's pants and you want to make sure they say I really like them. Because maybe you're wearing a black shirt, that means and I really like it. Okay, so you have students play this word card game, they have to show the right card. But it helps them to learn the grammar. And so now we're going to personalize it, okay? So everyone out there, who is wearing blue jeans? Who's wearing blue jeans? Yes, Carla, Anna, Ryan, <laughs> Nancy. Okay, if you're wearing blue jeans, then you're going to stand up, and then you're going to sing the part I'm wearing my blue jeans and I really like it. No, you really like them. Okay, so everybody else, let's sing. What are you wearing? What are you wearing? Blue jeans, people. I'm wearing my blue jeans and I really like them. Okay, so what you can do is look at your class and then you see kids that, oh, three of them are wearing brown shoes. So I'm going to ask, who's wearing brown shoes? Okay, you're going to sing the verse. And that way, if you have shy students, you've picked something that you can see more than one student is wearing so that nobody has to feel alone. Okay, Lydia, I'm glad you're wearing your blue jeans and you love them. Nice. Okay, so that's why we personalize it also, right, to connect to uh, the students' real lives, and it helps them to remember the language better, and it'll actually be language that they might use outside the classroom. Hopefully, though, they're not just singing that to someone. <laughs> what are you wearing? I'm wearing my sunglasses. Yeah, mm-hmm. Anyway, you're giving them good language. Okay, now, the next activity is called Fix It. Okay, the first step is to read a story. Okay, this is going to be my context. And by the way, this story is based on a folktale from Ukraine. I know that there are a lot of teachers from Ukraine here because I saw you at the beginning. Okay, Ukraine, yes. Yulia, Oksana, are you excited? Okay, I hope you recognize this folktale. It's called Too Many Animals. Now, um, before we begin, everybody, I want you to do something for me. I want you to just draw your favorite animal really quick. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Draw your favorite animal. Ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so either you drew it or at least write it down. Okay, I see. You read a wolf, lion, rabbit. Nice. Okay, so now I'm going to read the story to you. Okay, it's called Too Many Animals by Sophia Feldman. It is raining. There is a nice dry shed. A butterfly is flying into the shed. Does someone have a butterfly? Ah, oh, that's your favorite animal. A frog is hopping into the shed. Who has a frog? Yay! Now there are two animals. Two birds are flying in. Who has a bird? Now there are four animals. Two ducks are swimming in. Anyone have a duck? 
nice. Now there are six animals. Two goats are climbing in. Any goat fans? I love goats. Mm-hmm. Now there are eight animals. A horse is running in. Now there are nine animals. A cow is walking in. Any cow fans? Yes. How many animals are there now? How many animals? <gasps> Ten. Ten animals. <gasps> there are too many animals. And now the shed broke. Okay. So that's the story. Now we're going to play a game called Fix It. So if you hear a mistake, then you have to say fix it and then tell me how to correct it, okay? So maybe I'll make a mistake, or maybe I'll have a friend tell this story. How about my friend? Here he is. Hi. Hi, kids. My name's Freddie. I'm going to read a story. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay, guys, don't forget, if Freddie makes a mistake, Type fix it. Okay, here we go. Too many animals. It is raining. There is a nice dry shed. A butterfly flying into the shed. <gasps> fix it. Freddie, you have to fix it. How do I fix it? How do I fix it? is ah a butterfly is flying into the shed a frog that's me is hopping into the shed now there are two animals two birds flying in <gasps> fix it how do i fix it are. Oh, two birds are flying in. Now there are four animals. Two ducks are swimming in. Now there are six animals. Two goats are climbing in. Now there are eight animals. A horse running in. Uh oh, I have to fix it. How? A horse is running in. Now there are nine animals. A cow is walking in. How many animals are there now? Too many animals. Did you enjoy my story? Thank you for helping me fix it. Okay, so was that fun? Do you think your students would like it? Sure, and it really helps them to notice the grammar. Okay, so uh, moving on, we have 10 minutes. So that was too many animals, and you can use fix it in almost any kind of story or activity. Ah, the story is popular in Russia too. Absolutely. Okay, so another game that you can play. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention. So when you do fix it, Sometimes it is fun to use the puppet, but also it can, sometimes teachers don't like to make mistakes, so your puppet can make the mistakes for students to fix it. And also it helps students realize that it's okay to make mistakes. And so when Freddie makes a mistake, he doesn't get upset. He just asks, how do I fix it? And then he fixes it. So you can model that with your students and make them feel more comfortable to speak out loud and feel free to make mistakes and ask you to help them fix it. All right, good, exactly. Very important for the affective filter. Thank you, Nancy. All right, so another game that you can play is Grammar Dice. So maybe you have um, a gr grammar activity. And in this case, we're talking about um, you know, using to, mm, 
to clean, to fight, okay? So zebras use their black and white fur. Hmm? What do they use their black and white fur for? To carry their babies? <laughs> to eat meat? <laughs> Ah, to hide in the grasslands. Okay, cats use their tongues to clean their fur. Okay, so anyway, you get the idea. So what you can do is after that, you can practice it by using the dice like this. So, you know, you can create, you can see the pattern there and then you just cut it out and then you can tape it. Okay, so one of the die has the animals on it, okay, and then the other one has the animal body part, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to shake it, ah, okay, so I have a kangaroo, okay, and oh, a tail, okay, so can you use the model and make a sentence, okay, Kangaroos use their tails to kangaroos use their tails to jump. Very good. And then the partner could say, yes, that's true. Kangaroos use their tails to jump. Okay, let's do another one. Hmm. Dog and tongue. Dogs use their tongues to lick their owners. <laughs> my, I have two dogs. They like to lick my face a lot to show they love me. To drink water, to cool down. Great. Okay, so you get the idea. So it makes it a little bit more fun, even though really you're just practicing this type of construction here. Okay? Very good. All right. So you can also use grammar dice and put words on them, right? So this is one about your family. Okay. So there's you and your friend. Okay. So you can put words on here. Okay. Now, another example of a way to make learning fun and the practice fun is a grammar spinner. Okay. So here you're learning, okay, some different constructions. What are you learning? How is the ice cream? How was the ice cream? All right? How were the cookies? Okay, so is, was, were. Okay, so maybe you're practicing the past tense. And you'll see that you can use these spinners. Okay, so first I made them here. Okay, so I just cut out the picture you see there. Okay, and then I used a paper clip and I put the paper clip through to make the spinner. Okay, just put the arrow there through the paper clip. See? All right, so I can do this and pick one item. Okay, oh, sorry, it did move, but it was on potato chips. Okay, potato chips. And then I'm going to spin. The verb, and it says were. Can you make a sentence? Can you make a sentence? The potato chips were delicious. The potato chips were salty. The potato chips were crunchy. Okay, very good. Let's do another one. Okay. Ah, son. Address. Address. Okay. Were. Were. Address were. Well, ah, okay. So that doesn't go. So I'm going to do it again. Address. Ah. Was. Beautiful. Okay. Very good. So, spinners, you could put different pictures, you can put different words. The whole point is that you try to combine them to make a game so that students can predict what sentence they're going to make and it'll help them to 
practice using the grammar correctly. Okay, so these are just a few ideas, but I hope you get the idea, right? That we need to contextualize the grammar, right? You need to make sure that you're presenting it within a context, like a song or a story. Try to use natural real world contexts and use a variety of texts or tasks, <laughs> a variety of texts, but also a variety of tasks. Okay, try to keep the classroom interesting. Also, make sure we're practicing the grammar using all four skills, which I think we did. And then use games to reinforce the target structures because it's important to practice and practice, but you don't want it to get boring and you don't want to do the same kind of exercises. So maybe with the practice, you use the song to practice and do the Q&A. Or maybe you use these spinners that are very easy to use. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this webinar about teaching grammar in real world context to young learners. And I thank you so much for your attention. If you want to keep in touch and know more about my work, definitely go to my Google site. And if you have any questions, you can also contact me through Facebook or email me. So I hope you enjoyed this and you learned a few new tips for making grammar fun and interesting for your young learners. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. If you have questions, let me know. Although we have two minutes. Great, thank you. What ages are the songs for? One of them is for kids who are around six years old. The What Are You Wearing? That was from level one. And the other song was from level three, where the kids might be eight years old. So it can be the range. And it also depends on their proficiency level. But it was from levels one and level three in our world. The textbook is called Our World, and it's published by National Geographic Learning. Level six, what age is it for? Oh, for Our World level six? Well, the kids might be 11 years old. It depends on when they start with level one, but they could be 11, maybe even 12 years old. Oh, great, Emily put the link to Our World. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, Joan. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Great. Yes. If you have YouTube any other channel, questions, please let YouTube us know. Um, I see a couple questions and I about have the certificate down here. If you're having any trouble YouTube downloading it, that sometimes happens if you're viewing you on use. mobile. And also, um, don't worry, National we will Geographic be sending Learning this along to you, along with the recording of the session and the slides, so you'll get all of those. be able to use for free. So please don't worry if you can't download it. I hope you all enjoyed the webinar today. Uh, thank you all for joining thank us, you. whether it was late in the evening or early morning or whatever time it was around the world for you. Um, again, we will be sending the certificate to you by email, so just stay tuned for that. It will come within five business days. Um, also, we would love for you to join another webinar with us. We put the link right up here in the slide. We do have one next week uh, for teaching adults, if any of you do do that, on critical thinking. And that's with uh, John Hughes, who's another one of the National Geographic Learning authors. And then we also have a Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube page. And we'd love for you to connect with us. So definitely take some time to do that. Um, thank you again for joining. And we do have a, uh, excuse me, a survey at the end of this that you'll be directed to. So we'd love to hear your feedback if you have some time. All right, and thank you, everyone, and thanks again, Joan. Joan just put her on site there. 
off. All right. Bye, everyone. I'll send you all to the survey now.